Hello, BookTube. I've got a mail haul for you today on this dark, rainy, freezing cold day in Boston. Uh, it's a bunch of envelopes, no boxes, and the first package uh, in the pile is the one that's going to please me the most. <laughs> I, know, <clears throat> I know that already. <laughs> I won't drag you through all of it, but I have a feeling this first one is a catalog. We're right in time for uh, uh, the autumn catalogs. And, uh, oh, yes, okay. All right, it's not just any catalog. <laughs> it's not just any catalog. It's one of my all-time favorite publishers. <laughs> no, certainly uh, one of my all-time favorite academic publishers, and this is Yale University Press. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm not going to drag you through the whole thing. I'm curious to know uh, some of their biggest things, and I'm also, of course, always curious to know... Uh, in their limited, they have a limited paperback section. I'm curious always to know whether or not I myself am blurbed on any of the paperbacks since I review a lot of uh, of Yale books. Uh, so I just want to take a, a quick look through here. Uh, there is a new book called The, the War for the Seas, a Maritime History of World War II. <laughs> uh, there's the world to begin the world over again, a new history of the American Revolution. Uh, this is this is very good. <laughs> this is this is exactly what I like. There's a new book on epidemics and society from uh, the Black Death through the Spanish flu epidemic all the way to the present day. Wonderful, wonderful. The uh, Yale Jewish Live series continues with Irving Berlin and Karl Marx. Uh, Oh, okay, there's lots and lots of stuff here. Great. Looks like uh, some Irish literature being translated for the first time. Uh, okay, all right. Well, I won't, I won't, uh, just, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> nature strange and beautiful. Uh, living th beings evolved and made the earth home. Oh my, okay. All right, well, let's, let's, uh, let's skip, if we can, let's, oh, wow, look at that. Uh, crossing the Rubicon, Caesar's decision and the fate of Rome. Doesn't that look good? Oh, boy. Uh, okay. All right, let's, uh, let's go, if we can, let's, let's, if we can make, if I can do it quickly, let's go straight ahead to the paperback section and see if Steve <laughs> is at all represented. Uh, maybe they don't make the uh, the paperback selection evident. Uh, oh yeah, no, they don't really do that. Okay, it looks like they're intermingled. Oh, that's not going to do us any good then. Like for instance, there's uh, the trade paperback of David Bentley Hart's translation of the New Testament, uh, and this little page here does not have a blurb for me, even though I did review that. Uh, uh, okay, all right. Looks like I'm, I am. Uh, squarely in the middle of here of uh oh okay all right uh abbas amanat uh, his great one volume history of iran is coming out in a trade paperback once again no blurb from steve but that part is not mysterious since that review was in the national on the other side of the world and nobody knows that the national even exists <laughs> and I, i'm constantly having to remind them and i should clearly do a more energetic job at that uh that might <clears throat> that might help quite a bit uh Although for I know there are there are social or political reasons involved in not in not uh, going there. Oh wow. Okay. There's a lot of. All right. Well, I won't take you through this then. There's a lot of uh, of paperbacks, and I'm gonna want to dig through this at great length. Oh my. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So the very first thing out of the batch is uh, the Yale University Press catalog uh, for the fall, with an, a good old fashioned request sheet. Good, <laughs> good. Uh, all right, so that's that's thing number one. Now we'll go on to the books. Uh, and the first one is Waffer Thin and Light as a Feather. So this is going to be something small. What have we got here? Ah, okay. Uh, this is a novel, I believe, and I think this is an English language translation. Uh, I think this was a hit in France. Translated from the French by Roz Schwartz. This is The Girl Who Reads on the Metro by Christine Ferret Fleury. The Girl Who Reads on the Metro, whimsical little thing. Uh, 
which comes out um, in October. Um, yeah, in the hands of one of France's master storytellers, one who turns her gaze toward the solitary nature of the contemporary Western world, the girl who reads on the metro is an essential reminder of an often overlooked joys of everyday life and a celebration of the daily rituals, serendipities, and small acts of love that make life quietly wonderful. <laughs> this person doesn't spend much time on any kind of subway system, I can tell. Uh, this is a modern-day fairy tale about a perfectly ordinary French woman whose life is forever changed when she meets a reclusive bookseller and his young daughter. Okay, well, I, uh, I think this came out last year. I think this was a fairly a fairly respectable hit in France. Yes? Uh, oh, no, it came out in 2017. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad that it's... Uh, do we have a date on this? October, yeah. I, I'm glad that it... Uh, that's got an English language translation. It's probably a little bit too much on the elfin side for me. <laughs> Usually, books of novels, especially about books, tend to be grotesquely saccharine, just to the point where I can barely read them. And they tend, with depressing regularity, to make my worst fiction of the year list every year. We'll have to hope that the girl who reads on the Metro escapes that grisly fate. Uh, probably it will anyway on a technicality because it's a work in translation. Uh, Okay, this next one is from Harvard University Press. It is by Daniel Milo, and it's called Good Enough. <laughs> that is the cover. <laughs> uh, the Tolerance for Mediocrity in Nature and Society. <laughs> uh, a spirited and irreverent critique. Uh, let's see here. Okay, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and hardly cruel world of nature, wrote Charles Darwin in 1856, three years before the publication of The Origin of Species. This is the exact opposite of the neo-Darwinian version of, nature, of natural selection, the great optimizer which rids organisms of superfluous elements and quantities. No, it doesn't. <sighs> there is no such thing as a great optimizer. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't rid you of superfluities. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Molecular biologists will attest the genome is a chaos with islands of perfection. No, they won't. <laughs> no, they won't do that. All right, we're, we're 0 for 2. <laughs> no, they won't do that. <laughs> no, they won't. Uh, population geneticists complete the messy tableau with the affirmation that random drift is at the origin of species more frequently than natural selection. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, that's three for three. Uh, survival of the fittest is a wrong metaphor. Luck is an asset far more precious than talent. Okay, all right. Uh, in this book, uh, natural philosopher Daniel Milo argues against the idea that the only that only the fittest organisms or traits will survive. Well, good for him, <laughs> since it was a, a very vigorously presented straw man to start with. You probably should order argue against it, but don't waste much time on it. Uh, while natural selection exists, Milo postulates natural selection does not explain everything. He does not dispute a common origin for life uh, of the action of selection at many points, but he argues that a conclusion of, quote, everything is for the best or fits a need would be mistaken. And that idea has permeated all of modern thought, from history to economics to sociology. Notice what's missing from that list. <laughs> evolutionary biology. It has not penetrated evolutionary bi biology because it's nonsense. <laughs> so of course it hasn't. This is, this, is, <laughs> this is a guy arguing that the popular misconception of evolutionary biology and, gene and uh, population genetics is wrong. And saying, instead of your mistaken view of those things, here's my mistaken view of those things. <laughs> the phenotypic variation side of evolution has been ignored by most population biologists. By that point, you can probably say it with me. No, it hasn't. <laughs> Evolutionary biologists have searched the world for perfect examples. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Back in the room? No, they haven't. <laughs> Milo now searches for things that do not fit very well. Nature is not the Olympic Games, and the best and worst organisms are equals. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, as long as they survive and reproduce. Excess, when you can with less, is as ubiquitous in nature as it is in society. 
It is true that totally useless organisms are rare. That doesn't watch Mitch McConnell on TV, apparently. Uh, but exaggerated ones are very common. Quantitative excess is inevitable. It originates from the asymmetry between too little and too much. Okay, well, this comes out in June, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm going to be arguing with this author throughout the whole length of it. Yeah, this comes out in, in uh, late June, and I will be right there. <laughs> I will be right on it. Uh, I have a feeling that a lot of the books in this list are going to be June, and I'm getting buried in June elsewhere as well, so uh, we'll just move on to the next one. I'm going to be arguing with that book. We'll see. The, uh, the, the author is not the author of the pub sheet, so uh, in any book, any book on this subject, even a, a popular book, although this can't be all that popular. It's from, it's from Harvard University Press, after all. But it, books on, on uh, evolution and new evolutionary thinking always appeal, so um, okay. This next one is almost certainly a June release. Yes, this is a June release. This is by Kelsey Ray Dimberg, and it is The Girl in the Rearview Mirror. Uh, set in steamy Arizona, The Girl in the Rearview Mirror is part modern noir, part thriller. Finn Hunt, the unforgettable narrator at the center of Dimberg's debut, oh, this is a debut, okay, is working a dull office job when she meets Philip Martin. She's working a dull office job, so she's not a girl. Because girls are in school and are the wards of their parents and don't have jobs. Okay, so instead she's the woman in the rearview mirror, and the reason this book is called The Girl in the Rearview Mirror is to try and trick you into buying it. Six years this has been going on. Six years <laughs> this bandwagon has been going on. Where, hey, if you like those other girls, maybe you like this girl. There's no girl in the book, but we're trying to trick you, so what difference does that make? <sighs> Philip Martin's confidence is undeniable. As long as he's been Arizona's golden boy, the son of Senator Jim Martin, he is now one of Phoenix's top real estate developers. His wife Marina is polished and successful in her own right, as aloof as Philip is charming. Together they share a precocious four-year-old, Amabel. Not Annabelle. Amabel. Uh, Finn charms Amabel immediately, and soon the two are inseparable with Finn taking on the role of a nanny to the Martins' only daughter. While the family's glamorous lifestyle is as intoxicating as the alcohol that fuels their fundraisers, Finn is most in awe of the comfort that comes from being part of their inner circle, sharing quick jokes with Philip before he leaves for work, consistently meeting Marina's high expectations, and spending long days with Amabel. Not Annabelle, Amabel. Because they're characters in a novel, so you can call them whatever the hell you want. <laughs> uh, seeing in her glimpses of the person she is becoming. Okay, all right. So, all right. So this is a thriller coming out in late June. Uh, the girl in the rearview mirror. All right. Let's let's move on. <laughs> let's let's just move on, shall we? <laughs> I knew there would be a fall from the Yale University Press catalog. I wasn't quite sure I was ready for a kind of Everest K two fall. Uh, what, oh, okay. All right. Great. We've seen this already. We've seen this already on this channel. This is uh, this is weird. This is. Uh, Coming out in September, uh, this is Sean Carroll's book, Something Deeply Hidden, and this is a bound galley. <laughs> so, in, in true quantum mechanics style, we are going backwards. We got, I showed you a finished copy of this last. Now we have a, uh, a review copy. Now, this is all about quantum mechanics. This is the many worlds theory. We just saw it the other day, so I'm sure a lot of you will remember it. Sean Carroll is, is, is uh, coming down firmly on the side of the many worlds theory in quantum physics, which says that every quantum event splits off a full universe, not just uh, a random fractal here and there, but a full universe. So a quantum event goes one way and all of a sudden, and by extension in the macro world, your decisions. So you decide at the last minute not to run for the bus. The, the quantum mechanics view of this would be that, in, that you immediately create an alternate universe in which you did run for the bus, and everything that flows from that second decision is part of that other universe and not part of your own. Uh, and this is Sean Carroll, who's, who's he's a terrific teacher, he's a terrific speaker, he's a terrific writer, uh, and he posits in this book that, that he goes whole hog for that theory, the, the many worlds theory. I myself am, uh, you'll be shocked to learn, no physicist. <laughs> uh, and I think it's one of those things that is just self-evidently not true. It, it's just self-evidently so extravagant that it might as well be God. 
it might as well be some religious pantheon. It's so self-evidently ridiculous that, that every quantum event, a thing so small and so brief that, it, to, to paraphrase Alan Ward's The Watchman, they can rightly be said not to have happened at all, that each one of those things spawns a universe with suns and local gravitational fields and billions of inhabitants. <laughs> okay, well, you, you, there's no way on earth that you can prove it, and, and there never will be. So, you know, you're free to say it, but it's kind of ridiculous, I think. It's, it's, it's overkill. It's theoretical overkill. But I, I, I just got the book, so, and I haven't actually read it. I never did get to Sean Carroll's book, so he could convince me. You never know. Uh, all right, but that was still a double. So what we want is uh, an upturn of this pendulum here. <laughs> so let's, let's see if we can do that. A, a romance novel would not be a miss. Uh, What is this? Oh. All right, it's the aforementioned Yale University Press. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. This is this is uh, this is <laughs> this is a paperback release. Something that came out, I think, two years ago. Uh, no? Or is this an original? Maybe this is an original? Uh, okay, well, I guess this is an original. I thought this wasn't. Uh, but anyway, this is going to be, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm stunned by this thing because I don't, I don't know what it is nor why I would ever get it. This comes out in late June, uh, and this is Against the Academics by St. Augustine. This is a new translation. This is volume one. Of his Cassisiacum uh, dialogues, in the first, in this first dialogue, this is expertly translated, translated by Michael Foley. Augustine and his interlocutors explore the history and teachings of the academic skepticism, which Augustine is both sympathetic to and critical of. The dialogue serves as a fitting launching point for a knowledge of God and the soul, and the overall subject of these four books. So is Yale gonna do all of these dialogues together? Why? Why would they do a new translation? I guess I guess they're an academic press. They can do whatever they want and this will probably go to schools. This isn't bilingual, right? No, no, it's not. <sighs> okay, that is genuinely strange. This is uh, this is St. Augustine for Augustine. Uh, the word would be Augustine completist. This is, okay, it has absolutely no popular <laughs> All right, okay, I am ready for a romance novel. <laughs> I invite by this point, you are too. Let's, let's forge on. We have a few more packages to go. This is a, a, a totally abstruse uh, mail haul so far. Let's, let's see what we can find here. Okay, all right, okay. All right, I'm now gonna give up, so we're just gonna play this out. You'll be more interested in this mail haul than I will. Uh, I am I am 100% certain now that there won't be anything here that even remotely approaches a Steve book. This is all just going to be for you, not for me, and that's fine. Uh, this is due in early November. It is another translated work. It's trans translated from the Finnish by Lola Rogers. It's actually an author that we saw in one of my earliest videos on this channel. This is a translation of The Colonel's Wife by Rosa Lixum. T a tiny little thing. Uh, in the final twilight moments of her life, an elderly woman looks back on her years in the thrall of fascism and Nazism. Both her authoritarian tendencies and her ecstatic engagement with the natural world are vividly and terrifyingly evoked in The Colonel's Wife, an astonishing and brave novel that resonates painfully with our own strained political moment. <sighs> okay, and it, uh, okay, it comes out in the fall. So I don't need to worry about it yet. It's a translated translated from the Finnish. Some of you probably know Rosa Lixum as an author a lot better than I do. Uh, but let's just forge on. <laughs> let's just forge on. This one will be uh, what a feminist track translated from the Croatian, something like that. 100 pages long. Comes out next month. Uh, of no interest to me whatsoever. I mean, surgically no interest to me whatsoever. So that I would rather sit in a automotive repair waiting room even though I don't have a car and I'm not a customer <laughs> but let, let's see okay <laughs> all right uh, this comes out in June this is 10 women who changed science and the world by Catherine Whitlock and Rodri Evans 
10 Women Who Changed Science and the World. The obst obstetrical anesthesiologist and inventor of Virginia Apgar, biochemist Gertrude Elion, chemist Dorothy Hodgkin, Harvard astronomer Henrietta Leavitt, neurobiologist Rita Levy Montes Montalcini, physicist uh, Lisa Meitner, biochemist Elsie Widdowson, and experimental physicist Cheng Shun Wu. Okay, uh, Marie Curie is not on this list, but she is in the in the subtitle here, as well as Rachel Carson. Okay, all right, this, this comes out in June. It's going to be uh, potted biographies of these ten women. Uh, now we'll move on. Uh, this is now your mail hall, not mine. There will be nothing in these next, there are two packages left, there will be nothing here at all. There will be, ah, okay. All right, well this would ordinarily have saved the whole thing, but it's a double. Uh, I'm glad I have it, uh, but we've seen this already. I, I have actually read this already, and it's fantastic. This is by Alexander Horowitz, and it is Our Dogs, Ourselves. Uh, the subtitle is The Story of a Singular Bond. Uh, and that's what it is. This is this is the author of Inside a Dog. Uh, uh, a groundbreaking and wholly entertaining exploration of the relationship between dogs and humans, and how that relationship affects both species. Uh, by going beyond cognitive science to consider the culture, laws, and human dynamics that govern that relationship, the author covers exciting and essentially new ground while shying away from the difficult subjects of, that explain so much about the interspecies pairing that has existed for thousands of years, but is still far from understood. From what we name them, to how we talk to them, to the essential question of whether or not our dogs love us too... <laughs> This book is a true celebration of the weird and wonderful human-dog connection and is sure to resonate with dog lovers and science enthusiasts alike. And this is due in September. I'm, I'm hoping that bookstores have the sense to keep it around on their new release tables until Christmas season because uh, if, if I had been... Ideally, if I had been this book's publisher, I would have scheduled its publication for after Halloween uh, so that, to make sure that it's in bookstores because this is... I mean, look at it. This is a book to give every dog person on your list, I and mean, everybody has a dog person on their list. Uh, some of the compelling questions explored in this book are: Should we de-sex our dogs? <laughs> uh, is my dog my family, my property, or somewhere in between? Uh, to breed or not to breed? And should I buy this stuff? Meaning the seven, the seventy billion dollar pet industry. Should I buy this all this stuff for my dog? Needless to say, Steve has very simple answers to all four of those questions and to all sorts of other questions raised in this book. There are very simple answers to these questions. They are all yes or no questions, and all the answers are no, almost. <laughs> so, but, but the book is fantastic. This author has a real knack for writing about dogs. So if you, uh, if you have a dog, as the saying goes, if you have a dog or you love, or you love someone who does, uh, then make sure to put this on your list for the fall, because it's, it's terrific. Uh, but it's a double, so it doesn't count to save this mail hall. This mail hall cannot be saved. So we're just going to do this. We'll do this last one, and then we'll be done. <laughs> uh, so what is this last one? Ah, okay. This is the finished copy of something we saw already. This comes out in July. Nice to have one coming out in July instead of in June. Uh, this is Shadowlands, the finished copy of Shadowlands, Fear and Freedom at the Oregon Standoff. Uh, in 2016, a group of armed, divinely inspired right-wing protesters led by Eamon Bundy occupied the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in the high desert of eastern Oregon, encamped in the shadowlands of the Republic, insisting that the federal government had no right to own public land. The occupiers were seen by a divided country as either dangerous extremists dressed up as cowboys or as heroes insisting on restoring the rule of the Constitution. And this is the big book that we all knew when you were watching that in the news. We all knew that this, a book like this was coming, and here it is. Uh, so this comes out in early July. I expect that it will get covered everywhere. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the people who review this book review it in Trump-centric terms. I, I think that will probably be the tack that most reviewers will take. I don't know where I will be reviewing it. I don't think I'm going to be able to resist the urge to write about it. But I think I'll probably do it on Open Letters rather than anywhere else. Uh, so there you go. That is that is a fairly big mail haul. 
I wish I could I wish I could say that I was squealing with happiness throughout, but a lot of these things just plain mystify me. <laughs> so, uh, but maybe they're interesting to you. I mean, these mail halls are for you as much as they are for me. So, we have Shadowlands about Eamon Bundy's standoff with the federal government. We have Our Dogs Ourselves by Alexandra Horowitz, a terrific book. If you're a dog person and you like reading about them, put it on your list. We have Ten Women Who Changed Science and the World. Uh, we have The Colonel's Wife by Rosa Lixum in an English language translation. We have Against the Academics by St. Augustine, volume one of four. Uh, we have Something Deeply Hidden by Sean Carroll, another copy. This one is it, it, an advanced copy, but still, it, the book is about the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. We have The Girl in the Rearview Mirror. Keep in mind, her name is Amabel, not Annabelle. Uh, even though no one else in the world has that name, her name is Amabel because she's a character in a novel and her parents know she is because they know they are. So why not call her Bugs Bunny? <laughs> uh, then we have Good Enough uh, by Daniel Milo about uh, evolution. Uh, and The Girl Who Reads on the Metro, a slim French novel. So a couple of, a couple of things in translation here. A uh, bit of fiction, bit of nonfiction, uh, the usual variety. <laughs> I just know Steve books, but that's okay. We, we take our breaks when we can. So I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book Two.